class, welcome back to World History 2. I hope you're all doing well today. We're going to continue our look at the revolutions. We'll be looking at the French Revolution today. And while we look at the French Revolution, I want you to pay attention to the headers of the video because we have several shifts in government during the French Revolution. And under each shift in the government, we see the activities that take place. And so I want you to pay attention to the red headers that describe the name of the government structure that occurs in France. Stay tuned for the power. Okay, board. class, we are now going to move into Revolutions Part 4. So today we're going to be speaking about the French Revolution and just some background information about the French Revolution. Again, it's not that uh, people are just living their happy lives and all of a sudden decide we're going to revolt against our government. Uh, there's background issues that take place. So in the 1780s, uh, France is in deep debt with, uh, with war debts. Uh, half of all their revenue was covering these war debts to include the war in, um, in America, the Amer American uh, Revolution or the Revolutionary War. Uh, half of France's revenue is going to pay for these wars that they're in, one being the Revolution, uh, Revolutionary War. But then on top of that, another quarter of their re revenue is being used to supply the French military. So if you think about the amount of money being spent by the French on war debts and then military, it comes out to three quarters of the country's income. And that's a lot of money to go just to those specific areas. That doesn't leave too much left for the operation of a country. So what do the French do? Well, they decide that they're going to increase taxes with high taxes on the aristocrats, which are the, uh, the upper class. It could be the nobility. Um, but the aristocrats. So these are the upper class people, and the upper class people, they're living, you know, fat and happy. They're living, uh, living a good life. They have mansions, they have estates, they have a whole lot of food and servants, and uh, they're, they're just living a good life because they're the upper class. Um, so putting these extra taxes or high taxes on the aristocrats uh, makes the, the upper class uh, they don't like these taxes put on them. So what happens is the aristocrats call uh, for Louis XVI to deal with this problem. And so what happens is they resurrect an organization or, or a, a government body, I should say it that way, uh, called uh, the Estate General. Now the Estate General was a representative council that was defunct. It had not been in operation for a long time. So the Estate General of 1789 is called. This defunct representative council was established in 1303, but had not met since 1614. And so now it's a, it's a good amount of time has gone by since this group even met. And obviously, if the last time they met, 1614, no one's alive that met. So this is going to be a whole like new council called the Estate General. So the aristocrats call for Louis XVI to reestablish this to deal with these taxes. But what he's thinking is that he'll actually use it to increase taxes so he can continue to live uh, his lavish lifestyle, but also to continue to, um, uh, or to deal with the, the aristocrats' anger. So in this estate general, there's representation for three groups. The first estate represents 100,000 Roman Catholic clergy. The second estate represents 400,000 nobles or aristocrats. And the third estate represents 24 million French or common people. So you can see it is just way lopsided towards the French um, common people. So these representatives are called estates. So one estate for the Catholics, one uh, clergy, one, one estate is for the nobles, and one estate is for the French uh, common people. So here's the issue. The third estate representing the people, although they had, a representative, had representatives, they only had one vote as an estate. Well, notice there were 24 million people being represented. So it was, it was seriously lopsided. And so the third estate demanded political reform, and along with that, demands social reform. Well, what happens is they don't come to a consensus, and they're very upset. The third estate becomes very upset. And on June 17, 1789, after fruitless debate, the third estate storms out of the, of the meeting, and they go to a nearby tennis court, 
and they swear to break away and create a constitution. This meeting on the tennis court is called the tennis court oath. And what happens is because they break away and they want to create their own constitution, they form a new body called the National Assembly. Well, what happens is violence breaks out between the royal forces and the National Assembly forces or the commoners. So the royal forces are the ones that are nobles, they're the aristocrats, they're the ones loyal to the king, all of that. And then the National Assembly forces are basically the commoners. And how many were there? They were The third estate was representing 24 million commoners. I mean, a massive amount of people. So this isn't good. You have a massive amount of people, 24 million, that are very upset. They break away, and now they're basically drawing lines against the first and second estate, the Catholic clergy and the nobles slash aristocrats. Now violence breaks out. So we're really setting the stage now for a revolution. The National Assembly... On July 14, 1789, an event takes place called the Storming of the Bastille. The Bastille was a prison in Paris. And the story behind this is that crowds storm the Bastille prison in search of, of weapons. The military in the prison, which is loyal to the king, which is loyal to the aristocrats, uh, basically because they're paying their, their paycheck, the military in the prison fight off the crowds for a while and they end up killing many commoners. But finally, the crowd overtakes the prison and hacks the military garrison, that's the soldiers in the fort, hacks them to death. They take their heads, stick them on spikes, and walk around the city of Paris through the streets with these heads on the pikes. So just a gruesome scene. The forces loyal to the king flee the city, and Paris is in the hands of the people. Here's a picture of the storming of the Bastille prison in Paris. Revolution and fighting spreads throughout France. The Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen in 1789 is produced, and this uh, basically was a declaration for the equality of men, the sovereignty re that sovereignty resides with the people, rights of life, liberty, and security. So if you're thinking back to the lecture on the Enlightenment, these are definitely big key points for the Enlightenment. And the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen uh, is very much uh, like the Declaration of Independence was for the colonists against the British. Okay, so we have this revolution and fighting is spread throughout France. First off, Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizens produced. Second, there's a war with Austria that complicates matters. And the issue with this is that Leopold II, who is Marie Antoinette's brother, and Marie Antoinette is Louis XVI's wife, so there's this there's this relationship within uh, through marriage. Leopold II is Austrian emperor, and he has alliances with other pro-French monarchies, uh, monarchy nations. And so basically, these nations they they like Louis. Well, the French revolutionaries tell Leopold to break off this um, all these alliances with these other. Uh, pro-French monarchy nations. So the revolutionaries tell Leopold, hey, cut your alliances with these other nations that like Louis, like the monarchy. Well, Leopold II refuses, and this leads to war. Okay, so the French Revolution, the Legislative Assembly. 1791 to 1792, France becomes a constitutional monarchy. So similar to Great Britain. France becomes a constitutional monarchy where men with property, about half the population own property, they have the right to vote in their representatives. And this is an Enlightenment ideal. This is good. This is what the, the Enlightenment would say should happen. But really what happens is it leads to more death because the revolutionary fighting continues. It's during this time, 1791 to 1792, that we have the adoption of the guillotine to execute people. This is a, a symbol of terror. Obviously, you know what the I have a picture coming up, but the guillotine cutting off people's heads. So symbol of terror. Thousands are executed in France, and actually death by guillotine stayed on the books for France. The last person killed by guillotine was in 1977 when that uh, last execution took place by the guillotine. 
the reason I'm bringing up this whole legislative assembly and all of this, this is setting up for what's going to take place where Napoleon grabs power. Okay, so um, the legislative assembly is uh, kind of the government establishment. It's constitutional monarchy, so there's still a king, but they have a, an assembly now kind of running the government. So they adopt the guillotine for execution. They adopt the tricolor flag, so that's their French, red, white, and blue flag. And then they adopt the, um, the song La Marseillaise. I don't speak French, so I did the best I could. La Marseillaise, uh, which this is the French national anthem. Okay, so here's a picture uh, of the guillotine. So you see the body up there. His head's already cut off because of the bloody blade. Um, and you have uh, the guy holding the head. Now, this was uh, for the, revol uh, the uh, revolutionaries and all of that. There, This is um, a big show. People would come out and watch this, almost kind of like entertainment. Uh, you have the next person in line up here at the top of the steps. She's about to get laid down and get her head cut off. She's in. You know, she, her hands are bound. Uh, you have some soldiers here who are going to um, make sure this goes on, this execution takes place. I mean, you have this lady down here. She's sitting down here, like, knitting. So just a, a big show, you know, just another thing to go out and watch. Not good if you're on the anti-revolutionary side. Okay, 1792 to 1795 uh, is the National Convention. Louis the... 16th resisted the advice of the constitutional monarchist revolutionary. So we have a constitutional monarchy. The revolutionaries are okay with that. This this assembly, legislative assembly. Well, Louis the 16th is resisting this. And so in October of 1789, a revolutionary mob marches on Versailles. So remember a couple lectures ago we talked about Versailles. This is where the palace is, this is where the king is. And Louis the Sixteenth and his wife Marie Antoinette they they flee the palace because this mob attacks the palace. In June 1791 they have to flee again, and this time uh, they try to flee to Austria. But on their way to Austria they're caught on the road and they're hauled back to Paris. Louis the Sixteenth is forced to accept the Constitution, and the monarchy is now just a figurehead with no power. So by accepting this constitution, all power has now gone into the government, which is called the National Convention. So here's two pictures. There's one of Louis XVI on the left, and then one of Marie Antoinette on the right, uh, husband and wife. Um, they were not good monarchs. Uh, he, he was a, a chubby guy that liked his pleasure, and she was uh, an immature woman who liked to play queen over her own little realm. So much so that at the Palace of Versailles, there was a, um, a village built just for Marie Antoinette to play, uh, to play in. And so here's a painting of her in her village. And so back here is supposed to be Louis XVI. Uh, and these are some ladies in waiting. But here's Marie Antoinette sitting on the bench with a maid coming up with flowers. Now all of these buildings back here, uh, this is her village that was built for her to play in, to play um, like she was the queen of this village, very immature. And this is a view from the sky of Marie Antoinette's play village uh, that's today. And I'm going to put the cursor on the screen. Uh, you see if you can follow my arrow going around these walkway paths, uh, this is her village. This is a, these uh, have been re, uh, refurbished, but these are houses and buildings. These are full-size houses, several stories tall, several like additions and gardens. Here's more houses over here around this lake. This is this was built for her so she could play uh, play in it. The issue is that during the French Revolution, uh, Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette they're having all kinds of food and living in this palace when the people are starving they they can't even have bread and that's where you get this phrase Marie Antoinette supposedly said if they want bread that then let them eat cake because she was just so disconnected from the poor starving commoners which was the majority of France so and that's why the mob came and stormed the place so uh, this was uh, this is Marie Antoinette's village uh, that she would play in Again, this is a grown woman playing it. Okay, National Convention continued 1792 to 1795. November of 1792, Louis the Sixteenth is tried by the National Convention for treason after evidence he was plotting to get help from Austria to overthrow the revolutionaries. 
The revolutionaries are now backing the National Convention. January 21st, 1793, Louis XVI is beheaded by guillotine. That's a big deal. You have the king of France, his head's cut off. October 16th, 1793, Marie Antoinette, she is beheaded by the guillotine. And the next man on stage is Maximilien de Robespierre. You may have heard of him, Robespierre. So what happens is, after they're killed, Robespierre, who's in the government, uh, he's radical. Uh, they, they take over. The radicals take over. And it's led by Robespierre, uh, who is basically one of the leaders of the Reign of Terror, which was a phase of the French Revolution, well, especially when a lot of people were killed during um, the Reign of Terror. It's a, like a, a year-long time of a lot of people being killed. So the radicals uh, take over, and he is leader of the Reign of Terror. He's the leader of the Jacobin Party, and they dominate the National Convention. So the radicals are in charge now. There's a picture of him. So continuing with Robespierre, the radicals take over, and he's the leader of the Reign of Terror. He's the leader of the Jacobin Party, and he's also the leader of the Committee of Public Safety. Now, this committee created by the National Convention was to be an executive kind of branch of the government, especially during that reign of terror, like I said, 1793 to 1794, which we're coming up to here on the next slide. And what the purpose of this executive portion of the government, this committee of public safety, the importance of it is that it was to protect France from enemies, foreign and domestic. And so you can think of, yeah, foreign enemies, yeah, it's easy to, you know, obviously it's a foreigner trying to invade or something, but domestic enemies, that's important because it's basically saying whoever the, whoever the government says is an enemy, a domestic enemy, then you can deal with them. Protect France from these domestic enemies and... A lot of people would go to the guillotine. Under Robespierre, the government leadership became dictatorial. So you went from a king with a constitutional monarchy and the government was called the National Convention to basically the king being killed. Robespierre is the leader and the government still called National Convention but is a dictatorship. The reign of terror is from 1793 of 1794 to 1794. It's a phase of the French Revolution and basically, it began with the overthrow of the Girondins, which was a political party in the convention. Okay, so in the, in the convention of political parties, the Girondins were one of them. And the rise of the Jacobins under Robespierre. So you have the Girondins and the Jacobins come to, are, are gaining popularity and gaining power, and they overthrow the Girondins. And in this one year, 1,400 people were guillotined in, in one year. And it was to purge the country of enemies of the revolution. So that's the important part. When you start saying uh, to protect from enemies foreign and domestic, well, who's the domestic enemy? Well, in Robespierre's mind, the domestic enemy is someone that's against the revolution. So you start killing people that are against the revolution. That's why the French Revolution became very bloody uh, because of trying to purge uh, the politics of opposing views. So here's a picture. It's a painting, pretty famous painting um, called The Reign of Terror. And again, you see it's a big crowd. They're coming out. You know, um, the guy's about ready to be laid down there to get his head cut off. So well, kind of like a public spectacle, spectator sport. 1792 to 1795, continuing that time period of the French Revolution, we have the Counter-Revolution of 1794. And what's happening is that Robespierre was becoming too radical for the radicals. And so on July 27, 1794, his political opponents, who are revolutionaries themselves, okay, don't forget that, Okay, right now when I'm talking, we're not talking about the king and revolutionaries. We're talking about revolutionaries against revolutionaries. So the political opponents of Robespierre, they take a stand against him. Robespierre is arrested, uh, but then he was released after his arrest. 
the, the counter-revolution uh, infuriates him, and he rallies his forces to combat the people that ha- are now rising up against him. And, uh, however, he's captured and then he's executed. So uh, Robespierre is kind of out of the picture. But that leads to the Thermidorian reaction. The Thermidorian reaction is this. After the execution of Robespierre and his supporters, the moderate revolutionaries take control of the revolution, the French Revolution. So Robespierre was radical. Well, now the reaction to this based on the counter-revolution, is that the moderates take place. Kind of more, let's say, level-headed, if you will. Moderates take uh, take control of the French Revolution to try to calm it down. So here's a picture of uh, Robespierre being executed. All right, so the French Revolution, another shift in government where it goes from the National Convention to the Directory. 1795, the directory is set up, and that is a group of five men who collectively held executive power in France. And this is according to the Constitution of 1795. Now, these five men were chosen by a newly established legislature, which contained two houses, a lower house and an upper house. The lower house is the Council of 500, which is representative of the commoners. The Council of Ancients is the upper house, and these would be more of the um, aristocrats or, or the nobility. Again, the nobility are still there. It's not like all the nobility are killed or anything like that. It's just that this revolution is taking place. So these five men are chosen by the legislature. Leaders in this government uh, actually then become corrupt. And what happens is the directory is overthrown by Napoleon Bonaparte on November 9th of 1799 at the coup of Brumaire. So this is the, the directory. 1799 to 1804, we have the consulate. This is the last government structure for the French Revolution. It was ruled from the fall of the directory until the start of the Napoleonic Empire in 1804. Now, the consulate is ruled by Napoleon Bonaparte. So the directory is overthrown by Napoleon, and it basically morphs into the consulate. And this is ruled by Napoleon, by Abbe Saez, and by Roger Ducot. Now, these three guys are supposed to be equal in power uh, as a consulate and, and to be, uh, they're able to run the country now. In 1804, Napoleon was uh, the most popular of the consulate. And uh, basically, History states that he has 99% approval of the people, which is just extraordinary to have that high of approval rating. And what he does is he consolidates his power to be uh, the most powerful of of, of the three men, uh, Bonaparte, Saez, and Ducot. So Bonaparte definitely comes out as the most powerful. And in 1804, he overthrows the consulate and declares himself the emperor of France. There's Napoleon, his uh, trademark stance with his hand inside of his waistcoat. And that's going to be it for the French Revolution because the next lecture coming up is going to be on Napoleon himself. All right, class, that's it for today. We've now set the stage pretty much for Napoleon to come onto the scene. And so next time in our next video, we'll be looking at Napoleon. We'll be looking at his life and his rule, some of the battles that he was in, and what goes on with Napoleon. I'll see you then.